Good afternoon and welcome to today's energy seminar. Uh, I'm really excited that it's a great privilege to introduce our speaker today, Ben Parker, the CEO and founder of Lightspeed. As an interesting backstory, two preliminary remarks. Uh, a, uh, as you probably noticed, we had a different speaker originally uh, scheduled for today who will actually speak in about a month because of a family uh, emergency, I believe, in India. So he's out of the country. So we're kind of stuck. And we did, as you saw, so we, did, we did have, um, in the, uh, the first week, a, uh, Akshay Baskaran, who I think was very popular, who suggested a number of other people who he thought would be great for this uh, seminar series. And at the top of the list was Ben. Then I can actually show you the email to prove it, really? uh, Ben Parker. <laughs> so then uh, Rachel, as we were finishing up last week, said, uh, Akshay, can you get one of the top people on your list? And fortunately, uh, Ben came through for us, so we really, really appreciate, uh, in addition to being willing to give a seminar in general, kind of filling the, uh, filling the uh, gap we had unexpectedly now. So as you could see from his uh, bio and whatnot, he's kind of a uh, engineer design uh, inventor, entrepreneur of uh, great, um, great renown, uh, and also this backstory about uh, being on a RV road trip during COVID and coming up with the idea of uh, electric RVs is, uh, you know, it's like you can't make this stuff up. It's just a great, um, I'm uh, anxious to buy the movie rights for that one. So uh, with that introduction, I'm just going to turn it over to Ben to tell you how, what he did and how he did it and what he's going to do next. I, th I think that's going to be really exciting. Thank you, Ben. Thanks. Thanks, Prof. John. It's, uh, it's really great to see you all. Thanks. Thanks for coming out on a, you know, late on an afternoon. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's fun to be here, too. It's, it's, I feel like it's almost, uh, it's better to have not had much, much lead up to this because I'll just give you my stream of conscious for, for half an hour or so here. Um, it's also fun to have have Raju and Dukuri in the in the audience over there. He's one of uh, really my earliest investors and has supported me for the better part of a decade at this point. And I think uh, I was thinking in the bathroom just now if there's if there's one thing that you should all take from my story here, it's that you got to find people like this who will support you from the the early days. If you have uh, if you have those sort of people in your corner, that is that is the unlock to you know to making making things like like Lightship happen. So yeah, oh, I'm a huge huge debt of gratitude. Raju's Raju's the best. Find find your Raju. Um, so well, I think let's see. I can I can start by telling you a little bit about who I am and some of my story and and uh, and how it 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 morphs into Lightship. Um, here, I'll give you a, I'll give you a few some some eye candy. Um, I uh, I'm a Nantucketer. I grew up grew up on the the island of Nantucket uh, in the in the 90s and and 2000s. Nantucket's a um, many of you may, may know it, but it's a it's a little five by ten mile island about 30 miles off the coast of of Massachusetts. It's just off of Cape Cod. If you look it up on on a map. It was uh, it was the whaling capital of the world in the the mid 1800s, and it it's uh, it kind of holds on to that that history. So it's a the, basically I spent 18 years growing up in a time capsule, which which is a it was um, such a bizarre childhood in retrospect. But like like for anybody, it just felt it felt you know it, it was it was my upbringing. It was what I what I knew growing up. Uh, what I didn't know was I. I think I went to to McDonald's maybe, maybe half a dozen times in in all, all of my childhood, and and didn't uh, uh, d didn't didn't have TV until or cable TV until we were thirteen or fourteen, uh, and uh, it was it was a place where in the in the winter time uh, all of the time that I I was growing up there there was a there was a coal fired power plant uh, that was the only source of energy or power for, for the island. And the, the power plant was this little local power plant that would fail uh, in the wintertime and leave us, leave us you know, blacked out. And, uh, and we, had, we had kerosene lamps that we would, we would, we would turn on to, to light the house. It sounds, it's not, 
maybe quite as rustic as I'm, I'm making it out to be, but it was, it was, uh, it was a very interesting childhood in, in retrospect. Um, I, let's see, I guess I, I did not know that I was going to be an engineer uh, when I was still in high school, but some of the, some of the inklings were there much, much of my time in high school. Um, I spent down in the, in the auto shop or, or, or working in the wood shop. Uh, Nantucket, maybe somewhat surprisingly for those of you who know its, its reputation, has a pretty vibrant trades community. And um, bless whoever it was who, uh, you know, in the, in the town government or school administration who decided to invest really heavily in, in, a, in strong vocational programs at, at the high school. And I, yeah, you, you could find me pretty often down in, uh, in Bob Day's auto shop. Bob Day was the auto shop teacher for, for decades and a, really a mentor of mine, uh, usually you know, skipping the first half of biology class or, or something like that. And I still actually take some of the, some of the mantras that I sort of repeat to, to the team now. I borrow from Bob Day. He, he had one where he would always say, a clean shop is a happy shop. <laughs> and, and, it's, and it's true, because it, uh, you know, having a very organized workspace sort of becomes an unlock for, for, um, for, for, for a productive team or high output team. He also used to say, I guess I'm moving away from this one now a little bit as we're, as we're getting towards production. But he always used to say in, in very pained tones, don't make me be a cop. I don't want to be a cop. And, uh, I, I, I think er, early on in, in my journey with, with Lightship, it was, I was, uh, I was always, um, I didn't, I didn't want to put too many people off. I, you know, I didn't, didn't always want to be the, the bad guy. I'm, my co-founder and I are both now, now learning that you sort of have to do that at some, some thresholds in, in building a business like this, because it's, uh, completely impossible to please, please everybody and still, still achieve what we need to. But anyway, Bob Day rings 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 in my ear still. Um, I let's see. So I I graduated in uh, 2012. I made my way to to Hanover, New Hampshire, to to Dartmouth. Um, didn't didn't make it out, out this far, but the, although I you know I've, I've come to Silicon Valley in the end. Um, I went to I went to Dartmouth more than anything. Um, it's kind of kind of a funny reason. I knew it was a good school. Had a few options. Uh, and I wanted to go here because there was there was this Formula Student Racing Team. I don't have a I don't have a full picture of the car, but this was the this was the race car that we we built. Um, you it's a some of you may be familiar with it. For, Formula Student Racing is a is a program where um, university teams come together to design and build a, a open open wheeled race car for for competition against other other university teams. Typically, they're 30 to 50 person teams. It's a two year design cycle. And so every two years, the, the team will fundraise for and then design and build a, a race car and go compete at, a, at a, you know, a local racetrack against other, other schools. That was huge for me. I was, I was on Dartmouth Formula Racing all, all four years that I was in college. I um, led the team my second, second two years as, as an upperclassman. And uh, lo lost a lot of hair over it, and 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 and, and gained gained some some good wisdom. I think um, the the engineering degree at Dartmouth, um, may, maybe it's similar at at Stanford, was a a pretty um, it was a it was kind of a it, it was it was broad but not deep. So it was a it was a general engineering sciences degree. Uh, I gravitated more towards mechanical engineering than any, anything else. But honestly, this, this experience working on, on this, this race car and leading, leading the race car team was probably um, now, in retrospect, one of the most valuable things that I, I at least pieces of knowledge that, uh, and know-how that I took from, from that, that whole four years in, in Hanover. Um, it uh, taught me so many things, I think. Uh, Resilience being one of them, there were many, many times where it was, it was, you know, it, we were, we were um, up against a rock in a hard place to to try to get this this vehicle done in time and to to have it be a, you know, successful car, and um, yeah, I just I, I I learned a lot about about how to how to how to get a you know a pretty complicated project done and to do it with with the help of a of a, a fairly large large team of people. So 
those those sorts of, of um, yeah, stu sort of student team experiences I think are really really invaluable for for uh, you know for thinking about entrepreneurship later later on in life. Uh, let's see after so after well actually while I was still in Dartmouth I um, started doing started doing internships. I, you can tell I'm, I'm very uh, I'm very practically minded. I've, I've sort of always always tended towards towards experiential learning and trying to be really hands on with with my work. I've, I I like like my co-founder Toby here. The two of us are um, extremely <laughs> extremely oriented towards doing, which I think you sort you sort of have to be, especially in you know in the in the early stages of a, of a project or or, or company. And uh, so I was doing did a did a handful of internships all all through school, maybe maybe three or four, maybe, maybe it was five internships. Um, the bulk of them were were at Tesla, so I. I uh, caught a lucky break, also, also in part through through Raju, in fact, uh, who who lives out lives out in Fremont and knew somebody at Tesla. Got it. Got an introduction to someone at Tesla. That led me to a, a recruiter at Tesla. Um, I the only thing that I knew about Tesla at the time, which was twenty this is twenty fifteen winter of twenty fifteen, was. Um, as a gearhead, I had, I had always watched this show growing up called Top Gear, which, may, which maybe many many of you know. It's a great you know British kind of auto enthusiast show, and I was I was totally devoted to it. I'd seen every episode. Top Gear has a, a famous or infamous episode about uh, the first Tesla Roadster. They they somehow I think I, now in retrospect, I wonder if it's because. Um, Tesla was working with Lotus on the Roadster, a, a, a British car company. Top Gear got their hands on a Tesla Roadster when Tesla was still in its in its infancy. Maybe this is maybe late mm, late two thousands, and they uh, they took it out on their test track to do the 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 you know the the lap the hot lap with the with the Roadster and. Uh, the roadster broke down. It, it was like one of the few, few cars in history that had broken down on, on the track. And there's still a lot of controversy ar around whether or not there was, uh, there was foul play involved. Um, I'm still interested to, to know the answer there. But I loved, I loved that story. And I, I loved uh, the idea of this new upstart car company that was trying to, you know, to do something totally different and was whether they were willing or not was 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 sort of failing in in the public eye and still and still trying and um, I think I, I was also thinking at the time about you know what 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 projects and technologies what what, what were some of the trends that were going to be really important for um, you know for for all of our future battery technology was one that was um, really clear to me that it was it was it was there was something happening with the lithium ion battery that was going to um, Change a lot of our lives, uh, and now now really has in a lot of ways. And I, I again, I had I had this break to to go work at Tesla. It was um, it was on a battery technology was the name of the team that I, I was interning on. Battery technology was um, it was later renamed battery cell research and development, but it was basically um, Tesla doing. A lot of lab-based work, or really lab lab-based and modeling work to improve the performance of the battery cell. Um, many of you may may know if you're you know if you if you're kind of deep deep in the energy sauce that uh, the battery cell is the atomic element of a, a battery pack in a Tesla battery pack. There are several thousand uh, cylindrical battery cells. Think it's like a like a large AA battery and um, perf improving the performance of that that battery cell was sort of the one of the key limiters to to making making electric vehicles great and affordable and long range and all, all the things that we want out of them. And so I uh, I got this internship to to do battery cell R and D. It was it was um, to, to maybe to, to lay it out to you. It was uh, me sitting down in a very loud test lab in the basement of uh, Tesla's headquarters over on on Deer Creek Road, just off of, off of Arasadero, and there it was this lab that was full of I don't know thirty or forty giant humming test machines. Each of those test machines was testing uh, 
mm, maybe 100 battery cells, something like that. So there were thousands of battery cells on test, and Tesla was charging and discharging these battery cells to understand how they performed over life and in a variety of conditions, different temperatures and things like that, and then would use that data along with um, along with a, a, an analytical understanding of what was happening in the battery cell to uh, construct a broader understanding of how the battery cell performance could be improved uh, to, to make, make the vehicles better. And I did maybe, let's see, I did three, um, three internships at Tesla. Two of them were on this battery cell R&D team. It was really interesting, um, I think, and I was, I was, uh, I was sort of, uh, enraptured with the technology. I thought it was going to be a big deal. It was something that I wanted to work on. I learned pretty quickly that I didn't want to work in a, in a lab setting. I, I had loved working on this car in college and working as close to the product as possible and thinking about, um, I really love the, the sort of whole system level view of, of, a, of, a, of a complicated product like a car. And so I, I knew I wanted to keep working on batteries. I, uh, I wanted to get closer to actually working on the product, the, 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 full, the full vehicle battery. And the best way that I could figure out to, to do that was I went to a, I went to a lunch talk that uh, a manager on the, the, battery, the battery engineering team, sort of the product engineering team, gave during, during one of my, my first internships there. And I went up to the guy after, and I uh, his name is Ernest. He's he's a, he's also a, also an early investor of ours now. And I told him how uh, how awesome I, th I I thought what what they were working on was. And uh, he was sort of friendly but nonplussed. And then I badgered him over email for uh, the next year and a half or so, and uh, eventually got got another internship out of that. Um, he this was this was kind of cheeky. It was it was the the summer that I was graduating college, I knew I wanted to go over to this this battery product engineering team. Uh, I I knew that I was going to graduate halfway through the internship, and so I took the internship anyway. I graduated halfway through it. I flew back for a weekend, got my degree, and then came back and, and finished the internship. And my my thinking there, rightly, I think uh, in retrospect, that it was that it was going to be the best way in. To, to, to get to work on what, what I wanted to and learn and you know b become really competent in this work um, it, it was these were such hotly contested positions uh, to you know to sort of work on the core of the technology and to, and to work on the product at the same time that it was it was I, I, um, I was trying anything I could to, to improve my odds to, to, to do that work uh, the, that last in summer internship went great it uh, led me to a to a full time job there. Uh, I spent the next, let's see, yeah, close close to five years working working there full time. Now as a as a battery uh, product designer, a product design engineer, and it was uh, it was I, Lightship is now paralleling it or m m rivaling or or has perhaps bested. How crazy this job was, but it was such an amazing first job to to get to to work on. Uh, in my case, it was it was the start of the Model Three program, and so Tesla um, Tesla was in the 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 third stage of the original master plan, which was to you know to eventually get to a, a high volume, low cost mass market EV, the first of its kind. And uh, in twenty early twenty sixteen, when I when I took the job. Uh, the the program was just at its origins, so the the framework for the Model Three had been laid out, but none of the detail had been had been uh, had been filled in. So Tesla knew generally that it wanted to build a, a thirty five thousand uh, dollar electric car, but uh, but there was a lot there was a lot of work to to be done to to realize that 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 idea. It was it was a huge jump for Tesla too because um, at the time. At the time, I think Tesla was producing maybe a couple tens of thousands of cars per year, and this was this was as it's as the Model Three as as Tesla's first mass market car was going to be a, a 
20 or 25 fold jump in volume up to about a half million cars per year, which to us at the time seemed completely unfathomable. It was, it was so crazy to imagine the, uh, the hand-built Model S's that were, that were being built in, in, in Fremont at the Fremont factory, going from that to 25 times that. Um, and the, the vision uh, was to do it in a, in a, in a, in a highly automated way as well. That was, that was part, of, part of how Tesla would get to this, uh, this low cost you know, the affordable EV, the first mass market EV, was to, to automate a lot of the production to pull some of the labor out of the vehicle so that, um, so that the, 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 the cost structure for the vehicle worked. Um, we, we set out, so I'll tell you a couple of photos here. These two are both from Tesla. This was, um, this was in the early days at the first Gigafactory. This, this is in uh, Reno, but really Sparks, Nevada. So it's it's just just outside of Reno. Um, it was Tesla's first big big powertrain factory. The ground was broke for it in I think 2015, but there wasn't there wasn't really much going on until mid mid 2016 or so. Mid really actually really late 2016. This this was probably this was maybe mid 2017 um, where. It was, as you can see, the uh, well. The, the story is that the the start of production date, the original start of production date for the Model Three was, uh, I think, July 2017. This was this was a couple months after July 2017, and I'm wearing a hard hat and a and a, a high visibility vest because the factory was still a construction zone, so there was literally like heavy construction still happening in the factory as as vehicle production was meant to be ramping up, uh, so we were behind, uh, and we stayed behind for for a while. This was uh, sort of much uh, much talked about. It was Tesla's production hell, as 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 uh, as many journalists have have called it. Actually, I think I think I think Elon Musk called it production hell as well. Um, it was it was basically a race against time and and cash because Tesla had. By by mid 2017, Tesla was totally committed to to going to production with with the Model Three, and so there were test, the company had huge debt obligations to to fulfill. It had, it had made all the investment to get production going. Uh, production was not going, so re the revenue from the car was not coming in the door, and so a huge you know a huge cash gulf was was emerging there. Um, we worked very hard for. The better part of two years to finally get get out of production hell to get the car truly into stable high volume production. Uh, I can tell you many many stories from the stories from the the uh, the Gigafactory production floor. The the high level of what we were doing was trying to remove production bottlenecks uh, in the in the in the in the build of the vehicle. There were when you you know when you build a complicated vehicle like that there are. Many thousands of parts that go into that vehicle. If uh, if any uh, if any one of them is missing, then you can't build the car. You can't finish the car, and that's so that's an enormous sort of logistical and assembly problem to to overcome. And so our day to day, which first first was first was much of the battery engineering team, and then as time went on, the production delays continued. More and more of the company just started to swarm this this part of the of the production operation to try to remove these bottlenecks. It was um, it was full tilt. Everyone sort of uh, broken out into into task forces, effectively working on the many many problems that that existed to try to speed up production and solve the you know the litany of challenges that that we had. We uh, we made it uh, just just by the by the skin of our teeth. It was I think it was. Uh, spring or summer of 2018, when we finally hit it, hit 5,000 car sets per per week. That was that was sort of the that was the that was the Goldilocks point where we uh, we had enough volume to, to you know to be stably in high volume production. And my my last um, one of my last projects at Tesla was working for about six months uh, in Germany. Now Tesla had acquired a a German machine building company in the Benelux region and. Uh, I had studied German in, in college, and so wanted to wanted to, to do some work there. It was really fun and, and challenging to work work in German. Uh, did that for about six months, working on 
the, the sort of final stage of, of the Model 3, which was to fully automate uh, the production of, of the vehicle. I, I think about Tesla in short, I, um, I'm so psyched that I started my career there. I, uh, you, you learn so much more from seeing how things should not be done than, than seeing how, how, they, how, they, how they should be done. Uh, if, if I'd gone to a, you know, a, a, a old established legacy auto OEM, I would have just seen the right way to, to do things. And yet, you know, 90% of learnings are, you, you miss because of that. So it was, uh, yeah, T Tesla was both an amazing team, kind of a hot mess at times, and just an awesome, awesome place to, to cut my teeth. Um, now, my last project there, I was I came back back to back to the to the Bay Area here. I was working back at the headquarters in Palo Alto, and the project was to work on Tesla's next generation battery design. Um, this next generation technology was uh, what is now going into the Cybertruck, um, and so I was sort of uh, designing the Cybertruck battery with 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 the team by day, and then I um, I had a little more time on my hands because I was. I was off of the, the production floor at this point, and I, um, I picked up a pet project. The, the project that I had was to try to electrify all of the food trucks in the Bay Area. Uh, why, would, why would I do that? Well, there's, a, there's a, effectively a rotating circuit of food trucks that come to, to Tesla's headquarters every day, uh, and all of these food trucks line up they all have gas generators that that they're that are you know humming through the whole uh, lunch service, and one generator exhaust pipe is spewing its fumes and its noise right into the order window of the next one because they're all they're all lined up like that. And I was, uh, you know, <laughs> going and get, going to these food trucks day after day, and I was just kind of fed up with it at some point. And what I think what killed me the most was. Knowing that the, the the products or the technology that were required to electrify something like a like a food truck operation were literally on the other side of the wall from from these these businesses, the, you know there were power walls being developed, um, and so I, I felt like something had to give, and so I worked for maybe nine or ten months with a, a whole bunch of food truckers all, all over the Bay Area. I was figuring out how to electrify their operation with them and just doing this on the, on the side. Where the idea for Lightship started to come to be was I would, I would tell people about this, this project with the, with the food trucks. And pretty, pretty often, RVs would come up in conversation as well. And I think, I think looking back, it's just because there are, there are very similar needs to you know between electrifying a food truck and an RV, but both of them have a bunch of appliances, household appliances on board that need to be run off of some some power system, and uh, so that that you can sort of see how my my thinking progresses there. Now, in the background, I actually I had not met Toby at this point. Um, we would later be be introduced through this guy, <laughs> Dorian, who maybe some of you have have met. Dorian West is a he's a he's a uh, Stanford alum, huge, huge Stanford supporter. He was um, he was really deeply involved in the Stanford Solar Car team for for many years, um, including including while he was here. And uh, Dorian Dorian uh, was kind of a Tesla lifer. He he was there and overlapped both do, both Toby's and my time at Tesla. Toby was at Tesla 2009 to 2015. Again, I was I was 2015 to 2020, and so Dorian was the the matchmaker for the two of us. Now, because we didn't know each other at the time. It's it's interesting that uh, both Toby and I were um, we, we we I think we both we both knew that we wanted to try something entrepreneurial. I, I had wanted to start a business for a long time. Uh, my my I didn't mention, but my dad is an innkeeper on Nantucket, so the the family business was was this this bed and breakfast, and I uh, I just always took a lot of inspiration from seeing him having built li literally built like from from scratch from a bare lot. Uh, this 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 inn and supported our whole family off it for you know for for decades and 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 continues to to run the inn and grew up working in small businesses too. I worked in a bakery and sandwich shop uh, called Something Natural. If any of you have have been to the island, it's the most amazing chocolate chip cookies in in the world, I think. And so it was kind of um, 
I guess it was baked in in a way, and I, I, I wanted to try this as well. Toby, Toby has a, a sort of a different entrepreneurial story, but both, both of us knew we, we wanted to do it. And in 2019, if you were working deep in the EV industry, you could, um, you could already see that the Model 3 was a success. It was, you know, it was taking off. It was a great product. People were, people were, were, were buying them in, in droves. And um, it, was, um, it, it was then, it, was then, it seemed inevitable that, that uh, electrification would continue, the electrification of the passenger car, at least. And that, that then begged the question for me and for Toby, two people who had you know, sort of cut their teeth working work on electric vehicles, what, what was next? What would be the next wave of, of electrification within, within ground transportation? Uh, you knew it had to happen, but you had to, you, you know, I was, um, I was looking in the, I was keeping in the back of my mind thinking about what would that next segment of, of vehicle electrification be? And frankly got lucky that the, the, the food truck project sort of led me to, to RVing because I may not have found it on my own. I, I grew up on this tiny island out to sea. I then lived in, in a college town in San Francisco. None of these three places are, uh, are sort of the, are the RV capitals of, of, of America. Most, mo a lot of RVing happens in, you know, more in middle, middle America where there's, where there's more space um, and, or at least in, in, you know, less densely populated regions of the country. And so, once, once I, once I uh, had had something to chase, which was this idea of, of electric RVing, then then that that sort of um, took me down a path that I can describe. So, COVID came. This was uh, what was that March March of 2020. I had been at Tesla for about five years. I was working on the Cybertruck battery. I had this side project. I've been thinking about uh, thinking about uh, electric RVs. At, you know, at the same time as electric food trucks. And uh, yeah, like like all of us, was cooped up in, in my apartment. And um, I guess uh, I guess it was a confluence of things in my mind. But some, something gave where I just I remember I'd been ruminating on it, and then there was one moment where I was sitting at my desk. It was this this crappy like sixty dollar little Amazon desk in in my back office, and. I had called up a, a, a family RV rental business in Antioch, California, out, out just past the East Bay. And they, right at the start of COVID, um, their phone was dead. They, everyone, was, everyone was sort of in shock at what was happening. And so they hadn't, they hadn't really had any, any, anybody call for a while. And so they gave me a really great deal, or they offered me a, a great deal on an RV rental through that, that whole first summer. And I was sort of sussing out what my plan would be if I were to do the crazy thing and, and jump. Uh, they, they kind of made my decision for me in the end because uh, these folks, Steve and Shelly, who are the business owners, called me back a couple days later. They told me they were, they were going to hold this great deal that, that they'd given me. Uh, and they said to me, hey, I know our phone was, our, was dead a couple days ago, but it's now ringing off the hook because everyone has realized that going RVing is the thing to do this summer if you're trying to, you know, if you're trying to, trying to, to isolate uh, while, while also not being, not being cooped up in your house. And so, Ben, if you... Uh, if you're going to do this, you got to do this now. We, like we need you to commit to this. And I said, okay, let me call you back in in just a couple minutes. I just got. I have to sit with this for a second. And I that moment, I sat with it and I said, yeah, this is probably the fork in in the road. And in, in, you know, my at least at this point in my life. And uh, so I'm either going to do it or I'm not. And uh, something told me to do it. So I called him back and, and I said, yeah, sure, I'll 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 take the deal. And then I called my manager and I said. Uh, it's time, you know, I know we've been talking about this. It's time for me to go, uh, and that that set a whole train in, in motion. I ended up uh, carting all of my stuff out to out to Antioch. I this was not the RV that I went with. It was I I rented a it was a thirty foot Winnebago big big motorhome and lived out of it out of it for that whole first summer of COVID. I covered maybe six thousand miles around the American West. I did a big big uh, big circuitous road trip of the west a big kind of counterclockwise loop uh, if you're if you're really interested I, I kept a medium blog I can you know mostly for the family and friends but I can I can share with you if you, if you want to see it uh, and it was it was awesome because I think it was it was um, it was the missing piece of conviction for me I knew that there was at this point I knew there was a big opportunity in RVing um, 
that can take, it, take us a little bit into the, some of the overview here too. I'd, I'd looked some of this, some of this I'd, I'd, I basically found some of this information already that um, RVing is an enormous pastime. It's, um, it is, uh, I, I think actually the thing that most blows my mind, actually to this day about, just to st kind of statistically about the industry is that by the numbers, one in 10 American families owns an RV. So this, this is like, this is how 10% of the country, it is the, it is the essential way that they get outdoors and, and, you know, and go on a road trip and experience, have those, those sorts of travel experiences. Um, that, that blew my mind that there were, whatever the number is, I think it's 12 or 13 million active RVs on the road. I, I loved boiling it down into, um, into sort of an annual shipments number as well, because I, I, coming from the auto industry, to, to see a half million vehicle market told me that there was a there was substantial room to to build a, a really kind of automotive style and automotive scale or nearly automotive scale um, production program against. That's one gig, a gig factory right there. Yeah, thousand. yeah, yeah, right. Yep, it's that's yeah, it's exactly right. If 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 every RV were were electrified, this is and and actually in in some cases it would be, uh, it would probably be more than than the first Gigafactory because if you think about electrifying trailers, that's one size of battery. If you want to electrify the whole motorhome, which is a a sort of drivable RV, anything from a Sprinter van up to a big converted bus, uh, there, then you've got huge huge battery capacity required. Um, so this this scale really excited me and I knew there was a big opportunity there. I, at that point, had, had done a bunch of research on the products that were out there. And it was, um, it was pretty clear to me that if you, if you looked at an RV from the 1990s and you looked at one today, fundamentally there, there had not been much change in, in, in what these products looked like or how they worked. Um, and the world has changed a lot in, in, in the last 30 years or so, and so clearly there was, you know, there was an opportunity for a, a, a sort of a rad radical rethink, if not at least a major update. Um, and so my, the last thing, now thinking back to the start of COVID, that I wanted to to assure myself about was that uh, n not just that this was a big opportunity and a big um, you know, a, sort of a, a, a white space for electrification, but that it was something that I personally wanted to uh, invest, you know, years, many years of, of, of my life, of my life force to, to, uh, to working on. And so, you know, b best way I, I knew to do that was to go take a long RV trip. What was me? Um, I had a really fun summer. I met a ton of other RVers out on the road. I was really um, kind of getting into the lifestyle and the culture of it. And also, uh, in a not so, I guess in a sneaky way, kind of doing, doing market research at the same time because I was, I was having conversations with people about what, what electrification would mean for, for them in, in their, their RVing experience. And it was pretty clear to me that um, there was a big opportunity to, to, to improve the, the experience of going RVing. And I, and I think for a, a consumer pastime, um, you sort of you sort of have to do that. That that improving the the consumer experience uh, becomes the engine for change, and so I was I was at that point sold. Um, generators would go away. Uh, I knew that there was a there was a a big impending problem with uh, the electrification of the pickup truck as well, because of, as some of you of you may may know. Um, EV trucks are amazing. They have sort of an Achilles heel around towing range. Most of them uh, deplete their battery very quickly if, if they're towing a, a big, heavy, and in particular, a, a, a not very aerodynamic load. And so I, all, all of the pieces of the opportunity were sort of crystallizing in my mind at that point. The, so at this point, uh, this was, I, I came back to the Bay Area after this long RV trip. I'd incorporated the company from the road. I used a, a Stripe service called Stripe Atlas, uh, and which was very useful for, for getting started, although our poor lawyer, bless him, had to unwind <laughs> half of the work that I did to, to redo it right. So make sure you get a good, good lawyer when you're, when you're starting to set up your incorporation docs correctly. Uh, came back to the Bay Area. I started working on our our first 
uh, our first prototype at this point. It's funny for me to, to this, these, these slides are a little bit outdated. The team is probably uh, somewhere between two and three times this size. Now we're, we're about a, let's see, we're about a 70 person team. We should be about, about 100 um, towards the end of this year. And um, at this point, though, as I got back to the Bay Area, I was uh, one person working on the prototype of just just uh, it was going to be just a just a battery system for an RV. I was I was going to start slow with it. Uh, I did this for six months or so. Uh, I'll save you a long story. I realized that I was building I was building the wrong thing. I was trying to to build a battery that I would then sell into the RV industry. Uh, this clear this quickly became apparent to me that it was uh, it was it was the wrong approach. Uh, of course, I needed to learn that the hard way and spend uh, much of my net worth to to get to that that realization. Uh, did so, realized uh, six months in that actually the the big opportunity here was to, or really really what was necessary to do was um, to go directly to the consumer and to build the the end product, the full you know the full vehicle. I think. You'll find this in a lot of industries, uh, maybe especially consumer industries, that um, you have to do that because many, many uh, entrenched industries don't want to change. They're, they're sort of structurally set up not to change. And so um, to work through them is a much slower and more fraught approach than to go directly to, to us, the end, the end consumer, to um, to, to, to sort of come with a better offering and, and, um, and gender change. So I realized, all right, got to go for broke here. We, we, we have to be light chip, America's first all electric RV manufacturer. We will do ground up vehicle manufacturing and we will be a, a, you know, a full vehicle design and manufacturing company. That was, uh, that was the crazy leap needed to take. Uh, things really picked up from there. Toby and I met that spring. He, um, it was sort of a perfect compliment. Again, we were introduced through Dorian, who was who was one of our one of our early investors as well. Um, where I brought more of the the product and engineering background, Toby has more of the finance background, um, and the the compliment was was clear between the two of us. He Toby's Toby's quick background is he um, he started as an investment banker at Morgan Stanley. He actually led the finance team at Tesla through the the early 2010s. Um, his he he did a couple couple amazing things at Tesla. Uh, he, he he spent several years working with his team to um, basically get the cost the cost structure of the Model S in line, sort of to pull enough cost out of the vehicle to sell to sell the Model S profitably, which was which was absolutely essential for 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 Tesla at the time. Um, and I could just tell after a couple weeks of of you know of 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 talking with him that we were um, we were in the same stage of life. We had a lot of shared experience from Tesla and, and actually believed very deeply in some of the same things. Maybe you could say that we had, we had a, a shared value set. And um, there's a, in, in picking your co-founder, there's a, uh, you have to, I think you have to rely on, to some extent, the advice of the, pe of the people around you, but also your own instinct on is this, is this the right person? Because you're not going to get very much time to, to court your co-founder, so to speak. So um, yeah, you have, to, you have to trust your intuition after, after you know, some, some amount of time working with them if you, if you don't know them already. And uh, luckily got that decision right. It's probably the best decision I'll ever, ever, ever make <laughs> at Lightship was, was taking co to be honest, as, as you know, co-founder and, and business partner. And um, at that point, we, we got to work. We, we had raised, um, raised some money already. We, uh, we, we were doing a, an angel round called a pre-seed round. We, we cut off that, that round of funding. We, uh, we then raised a, a, a seed round of institutional capital. Um, Toby, had, Toby had some, some kind of prior, prior connections to the, to the venture investment community. Uh, that was that was extremely helpful for us, and um, we were off to the races at that point. We well, yes and no. We had uh, we had some money at that point, but the next step was to hire our first first few employees. And you should you would think that with 
a good idea and some money in the bank that hiring your first few employees should be, a, should be an easy thing. It is not. It is not at all. It was very challenging to, fin to convince the first few people to, to join us because um, it, is an, it is an enormous risk. It's a, you know, it's a fraud endeavor to, to join a company that is, uh, at the time, it was, it was you know, two guys in a slide deck and, and, and some, <laughs> some money in the bank. And uh, so we were, we, were, uh, we were lucky to find, we, luckily the two of us know, know a lot of people in the EV industry. We, we found Nick first, who was our first hire. We, we basically worked for that first six or eight months to hire out a, a sort of core leadership team. Um, we thought long and hard about what the, the, the mission and the vision and the values behind the business would be and, um, and really focused on what, uh, what, were, what were the key the key disciplines or key departments that we wanted to invest in, invest in up front because they, we knew they would become the DNA of the business. Uh, I think we, we chose really well. The, the leadership team is amazing. The broader team that, that we've now built is um, just an incredible group of people, best group of people I've, I've ever had the, had the pleasure of working with. Uh, I'll flash us to present so we can take some, some questions. Um, we launched our product, the first product we call the L1 at South by Southwest last year. Uh, sold, sold out the first year of production in a week. We've, we've, we opened up a pre-order bank and we've, we've taken a, a, a large number of reservations since. We're now working to enter production at the end of this year to, um, to fulfill the backlog of, of orders that we have. Um, and we, we uh, this this was just a this is a functional prototype that we built. It sort of looks like works like, but is not at all durable. And if you if you squint too closely at it, you'll see there are lots of things that are wrong with it. Um, we're now at the stage this this year of I would say truly uh, operationalizing the business. So we have a, we just raised the Series B at the start of the year. We have raised uh, about sixty million dollars to date. We. Like I say, we're a seventy-person team. We're split between the Bay Area, where we do more of our product development, and Greater Denver, where uh, which we treat as as more of an operational hub for the business. So we we uh, we are we are producing these vehicles, assembling them ourselves in in a factory in just north of Denver, and uh, and so at the end of this year, we will start to produce this vehicle. This is our first and flagship product. We call it the L1. It is. Uh, I'm biased, but it's uh, I would call it the perfect travel trailer for the electric age. It solves the the issue of of uh, sort of range anxiety or to or towing towing range loss, which is something that must happen for for the electrification of the truck to also happen. Uh, if you own a pickup truck uh, or or a large SUV, you want to do truck stuff with it, and towing is is sort of uh, is the it is it is the 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 most truck of truck stuff. Um, and so the way that we do this, you know, we solve this towing range issue is kind of twofold. One, you can see that it's a very aerodynamic shape. We spent a lot of the first year really um, doing, doing a detailed aerodynamic analysis, CFD analysis to get to a drag optimum shape. We built a 26 foot long travel trailer. It's eight and a half feet wide. It's as wide as you can take on, on, a, on a, a normal road. Uh, it is as drag efficient as a Model 3 going down the road, which is a tiny passenger car. Because it is so drag efficient, that means that we can put a relatively small battery on board the trailer as well. Most trailers act as dead weight behind the vehicle that's, that's pulling them. Uh, in our case, this Model 3 size battery, along with a drive unit, a motor on the rear axle, allows the trailer to propel itself. So if the trailer can propel itself, then it helps the truck that's pulling it. and uh, if the truck is getting that boost, it's no longer spending its, its energy to, to tow the trailer. Thus, it does not lose range, or, or if it's a, a gas or, or a diesel vehicle, a traditional truck, it just doesn't lose any fuel economy. This, is, um, this idea of, of having a, a, a powered trailer is sort of a, I think it is a key, a key technological unlock. Where's the inverter in there, right? Hmm? You've got the inverter in there. Mm -hmm. Right next to the battery. Yeah. Yeah, we actually use um, one, one of the ways that Lightship can exist is 
if you were if you were trying to build an electric RV company in 2010, good luck because there was no automotive supply base for for EV components at that point. Uh, luckily, the auto industry has invested an enormous amount of capital over the past decade to build a really robust you know supply base of high quality, low cost EV components. We on time? Okay. And um, so we use we use components like that from from the auto industry. How how are we doing on time? Okay, okay. Any uh, any questions? Yeah, that could be, that was your first question or second okay. question. Yeah. We have time for just a couple of questions. Okay, maybe those two. Uh, yeah. So regarding the market for RVs, mm -hmm. uh, outside of North America, what are the top markets for RVs, electric RVs that you that you manufacture? Well, I'll start with RVs generally. Um, <coughs> Our, the, the RVing pastime is biggest in, in North America. It's about a, a 25 to $30 billion market here. It's roughly double that globally. The other main centers are Canada, um, continental Europe, and then there are some hot spots in places like Australia, for instance. Generally speaking, um, RVing is, is sort of it's at its core a, a, a middle class pastime. And so anywhere where you see the middle class growing quickly, uh, you, will, you will see RVing growing rapidly as well. I'm curious about the cost. Mm -hmm. So uh, a little bit higher than the normal maybe RVs. How do you see like cost cutting and or, or how do you see uh, going beyond like the premium market to, to mass uh, produce this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the right question. Um, yeah, so the, the, the first product we would sell in, in what you might call the premium mainstream segment. So this is, uh, you can sort of, uh, you can find RVs that cost millions of dollars. Very few of them are, are produced every year. In the premium mainstream segment, there are, uh, call it 10,000 trailers per year. This is something like an Airstream, for instance. So this is our, this is our launch segment. It's where we will um, sort of establish the brand and the technology. The, the idea is then to go down market with successive products. And um, you know, ultimately, the point of the company is to help the entire RV industry and pastime go electric. And so um, while well, we need to figure out how to build this product and the technology within it uh, at scale in an efficient way first, uh, we, um, we ultimately see products two and three, which we would call L2 and L3, as um, sort of catering to uh, slightly different RVing lifestyles, because there are many ways to go RVing, and of course, at, at, at lower price points. Any final questions? Let's do the last question right here, sir. Great. Uh, yeah, so for the RV stuff, uh, normally when you think about RV, you think about driving long distances and going to remote places. Mm -hmm. And those don't sound like a good fit for even a regular EV road trip, mm -hmm. let alone an RV trip. So I don't, I don't know, what do you think about this? Well, I think uh, a, a, key, a key part of this that you, you can actually see on this slide is, is um, the fact that an RV is a very large vehicle, and so you can build a lot of solar into the vehicle as well, that means that instead, instead of having only a significant amount of storage on board, you also have generation. The fact that you have a lot of generation uh, means that you can, you can basically, as long as the sun is shining on some level, you can keep, you can keep your, you know, your energy stores up, and so you can, you can have um, a sense of energy security even off-grid. Well, that's it. Uh, ben, thanks for that great tour through your past, present, and we're really excited to hear about your future. So come back and visit in a few years after you really make it big, which I'm sure you will. So well, let's thank Ben the last, one last time. For yeah, speaking. thanks, guys. Definitely uh, fi find me after with more questions. Sorry I didn't leave a little more time for it, but I'd, uh, I'd love to, love to you know, impart any, any thoughts I can. Thanks for your time.